Hello, we will be getting started in just a minute or so. Thanks for being with us. Stand by. We'll start in just a minute. Okay, I think I've got the right view. Good morning no, to you. Exciting. Yeah, we're covering a lot of, uh, I guess we're always covering a lot of time zones here, but even on the on the, the, the panel here, we are covering a, a wide expanse of time zones. So thank you for joining us. And uh, for those of you who will be watching this after the fact, thank you for joining us as well. My name is Mark Mamagonian. I'm the Director of Academic Affairs for the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. And it's my pleasure to uh, have a great group of people with us today and featured speaker. I have one brief announcement I would like to make for an upcoming event next week, uh, a week from today on Friday and on Saturday, October 15th and 16th, there is a conference uh, Gender and Intersectionality in Post-Soviet Armenia, which is organized by the Zorian Institute and the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute and co-sponsored by Nasser and other Armenian organizations. We hope you can sign up for that and, and catch uh, some of the sessions or all of the sessions, depending on how much time you have. Uh, more information is available on the websites of the Zorian Institute the Promise Armenian Institute, Nasser, and, and of the other co-sponsoring sites. We have other events being planned and finalized uh, for later in October, November, and December, not to mention beyond into 2022. As always, we hope you are receiving announcements of our programs if you're interested. If not, please let us know, and you can be put on our email list, or you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the like. And I am sure the same goes for our co-sponsors today, whom I would like to thank the Armenian Film Foundation and the Arat Eskijan Museum, two of our favorite organizations that we like to work with and who also deserve your support and interested engagement. So before we uh, introduce the program, I would like to hear from representatives of our co-sponsors, uh, Karla Garapetyan of the Armenian Film Foundation and Maggie Goshen of the Arat Eskijan Museum. We'll go alphabetically. Uh, I guess that means Carla. Thanks, Mark. Well, the Armenian Film Foundation is very happy to be a sponsor of this webinar. Our foundation, along with its founder, J. Michael Hagopian, was a supporter of Ruben Mamoulian. Michael Hagopian wanted to be sure that Mamoulian's contribution to film and filmmaking as both an Armenian and as an American was widely appreciated. Now, yesterday, I fished out from our old files a program from 1982, that's almost 30 years ago. It was a tribute to Mamoulian, held at the Norris Theater on the USC campus. Tony Hagopian, Michael Hagopian's wife, she saw me rummaging around and she told me she remembered picking up Ruben Mamoulian for that event from his home in Beverly Hills. Mamoulian would have been 85 at the time. She says one of the things she remembered about him was his deep sense of his Armenian identity. It was an identity he wore proudly, she said. And she says he was always willing to help other filmmakers. Indeed, the last correspondence I found about Mamoulian from our files was a letter written to him in 1986, one year before his death. It was about his support for an up and coming Armenian filmmaker. My point is this, and it speaks to Milena's presentation today. Mamoulian is a great American director. His Armenian identity, though, is a less discussed aspect of his work. Not least for that reason, we're very pleased to support this presentation today. Over to you, Maggie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark, for hosting. As always, it's a pleasure 
to participate and having Carla in, in addition, and of course, Milena. I met Milena a few years ago at the Art Eskijo Museum because in the museum, you never know who will walk in and inquire and uh, about an heirloom, a painting, a statue that they're doing some research or a resident. There were some residents who were celebrities who ended up in their senior years at the Arat home when they were in Los Angeles. Believe it or not, the building was Mary Pickford's house. So it was a Hollywood celebrity house where all the residents were. And here was Virginia Mamoulian was a resident there. And she was looking for information. It was an inspiration for me to see a young and upcoming scholar all the way from Georgia interested in the Mamoulian, and she was going to, uh, she's go, she was writing a publication, I believe, on Mamoulian family. She was also interested about the three paintings that we had in the library. The portrait are the three individuals. I, when I uh, acquired it, or it was given to me with hesitation because they were in such a dilapidated condition. And I said, what am I going to do with them? I don't know if funding will be restored because they were such a bad position. But the person was so adamant. He said, this is part of my life. You need to take care of them. They need to be, port the portrait should be in the library. And sure enough, we were able to restore it. And every morning when I walk in, the Mamoulians are looking at me. I didn't know anything about Mr. Mamoulian Sr. or Mrs. Mamoulian, except about Rupin Mamoulian, what I've heard from the, uh, from the um, uh, events or books or Google or this book and Mamoulian was an American director. Here comes a young upcoming scholar who's interested in the three paintings, information about Mrs. Mamoulian. So Milena, I am very grateful to you. You sparked my interest. So every publication I come across that I acquire for the library, I look, I rummage through and see if I'll find an article that will me, inspire me or add more to what I know. So I'm looking forward for this uh, presentation. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Carla. And uh, yeah, Mamoulian, of course, as as is inevitable, uh, ha has his own connection to, to Nasser as well. Back in the 1950s, uh, he was uh, an, an enthusiastic participant in, in the fundraising effort to raise money for the first chair in Armenian studies. Uh, in the United States at uh, Harvard University, and I believe, and also he was involved in the effort to raise money for the first chair on the West Coast at UCLA. And Mamoulian was a featured speaker at the 1959 Nasser Victory Banquet uh, in in at Harvard University. Uh, so he was involved in Armenian affairs, in Armenian community affairs, while also being an important part of. Uh, you know the the glitterati of uh, of Hollywood of of his time. So this isn't the first program on Mamoulian uh, that that Nasser has done in the twenty three years that I've been at Nasser, but it, it is I'm sorry to say only the second. Uh, the first was way back in two thousand and seven. Uh, so it's certainly long overdue that we have another one. So. In addition to, to, to today's talk, I also hope that in the near future, we can have an event that we've been talking about doing for a couple of years uh, for, uh, to, to have a conversation with our, our good friend, Mr. Paul Ignatius, who in addition to having been the Secretary of the Navy, President of the Washington Post, eponym for US Navy destroyer, father of Nasser's Executive Director, Sarah Ignatius and her distinguished siblings, and a robust centenarian is in addition to all these things, uh, new, uh, new Ruben Mamoulian, his parents and Mamoulian's family were, were good friends. And in fact, Paul makes an appearance or makes appearances in several of Mamoulian's 1930s films. So uh, Paul and I have talked several times over the years about having him do, do uh, a conversation about his memories of Mamoulian and Mamoulian's Hollywood. So we hope to make that happen in, in the near future. So a couple of years ago, NASA received a grant application from Dr. Milena Oganesian, uh, at that time a research associate uh, at the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage at the Smithsonian Institution, seeking support for her research project on Ruben Mamoulian. Uh, Mamoulian has certainly received some attention from biographers, though rather little from scholars of the stage and cinema, despite his significant contributions and his impact on both. A grant was arranged 
through the Knights of Vartan Fund for Armenian Studies, which Nasser helps administer. And today we get to hear some of the results of Milena's research. Milena Oganesian specializes in cultural heritage and identity studies. She holds a PhD in anthropology with a concentration in cultural heritage and an MA in history from the University of Montana, having previously earned a combined BA and MA in Near East history and international, international relations from the Tbilisi Institute of Asia and Africa in Georgia. She has taught history, cultural studies, and research methods at universities in the United States and in Georgia. She um, is a recipient of numerous awards and grants, including the, the previously mentioned grant from the Knights of Vartan Fund and from the Philanthropic Educational Association's International Peace Scholarship, among others. She has worked as a translator and she speaks Armenian, Russian, Georgian, and Turkish. She will be speaking English today. Uh, we will be having a Q&A uh, with our speaker after her presentation. If you wish to ask a question, please use the Zoom Q&A function. Please don't use the chat for, for Q&A because uh, we want to have them all in one place. So with that, please welcome Dr. Milena Oganesian speaking to us today from the city of Ruben Mamoulian's booth, birth Tiflis, Tbilisi, on the day of Ruben Mamoulian's birth 124 years ago. Milena. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, the sponsors and, and everyone who is here today joining us uh, for this exciting opportunity for me to present on Ruben Mamoulian um, and also share some of my research findings. Um, what began as an accidental discovery of the archive of Ruben Mamoulian papers preserved at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C has turned into an exciting and at times challenging, but also rewarding multi-sided research journey through time and space. This is a work in progress. Um, in this project, I have employed the methods of our archival research, anthropological approaches to data collection, data management, and analysis among other techniques. My language skills have allowed me to access um, diverse material. Um, some of the languages um, that Mamoulian spoke, or I should rather say, I speak some of the languages that Mamoulian spoke. Over the past years, I have consulted 13 archives, libraries, and museums in the United States, the United Kingdom, Armenia, Georgia, and Russia, and Aradeskijan Museum was one of them. Um, I have also been conducting oral history interviews with public figures, directors, scholars, and others, including Mr. Paul Ignatius, in one way or another, have encountered or worked with Ruben Mamoulian. I am honored and deeply appreciate the support I've received for this project from the Knights of Wartan Fund for Armenian Studies and the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research to conduct my uh, research in Los Angeles. I'm also forever grateful to the Galus Goldmikian Foundation for their grant to do research at the Library of Congress. The unwavering support an encouragement that I have received from so many people, including my friends, family, and, and others, have given me additional inspiration to continue this project and to its um, until its uh, full fruition. The world of Ruben Mamoulian is boundless. Uh, his identity and directorial works are multifaceted and rather eclectic. Mamoulian ex Mamoulian's exposure to the Armenian. Russian, Georgian, French, English, and American cultures have undoubtedly left imprints on his personal and professional lives and the world views. Um, so let's see, so I'm trying to. Um, so in this presentation on today's occasion on Mamoulian's 100. 24th birth anniversary, I will provide some of the major highlights um, of Mamoulian's artistic conceptions, life experiences, and the director's Armenian heritage related to his work. Ruben Mamoulian was one of America's most outstanding, imaginative, and pioneering theater and film directors of the 20th century. His artistic vision, innovative ideas, unabated experimentations in various media, and wholehearted devotion to the arts of stage and screen 
have left remarkable footprints on the history of the American musical theater, film, and culture. Ruben Mamouyan was a private man. He allowed little details of his personal lives to be, life to be known to the public. His formal demeanor, formidable appearance, subtle humor, dark shell-rimmed spectacles, an ever-present cigar, which was rarely in his mouth, made him rather intimidating for some. He was referred to as an autocrat and had a reputation for being a difficult, quote unquote, difficult director. Others, however, regarded Mamouyan as a kind-hearted figure, committed to bringing out the best in the actors and serving their art. And most of all, Mamouyan loved art, loved art. Uh, Ruben Mamoulian was born in the twilight of the 19th century um, in Tiflis. And Tiflis was renamed Tbilisi after, 19, uh, after 1936. At the time, Tiflis was uh, the administrative seat of the Caucasus Wilds royalty, a southern frontier of the Russian Empire spanning between the Black and the Caspian Seas, where the interests of the Russian British, Ottoman, and Persian empires often clashed. Because of its elaborate European and local art art architectural styles and splendid theaters and exquisite boutiques, Tiflis was often called Little Paris. Historically, Tiflis has been home to diverse religions, uh, religious, linguistic, uh, and ethnic groups. And according to scholars Anchabadze and Bolkava, by 1899, the population of the area was comprised of Georgians, 26%, Armenians, 36.4%, the largest group at the time, Russians, 21.3%, and others being 16.5%. Um, Tiflis was also a major center of the 19th and early 20th century Armenian cultural, intellectual, and artistic life. After the closures of the Armenian theaters in Constantinople and other provinces of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, many Ottoman Armenian uh, actors and actresses trained in Europe settled in Tiflis. Ruben spent his early formative years in Tiflis, where, as he often recalled, was influenced by the cosmopolitan atmosphere of the town in the Armenian theatrical traditions. Ruben was born to Armenian parents. His father, Zachary Mamoulian, came from Ukraine, that was not far from Tiflis at the time, where Ruben would spend his summers with his favorite grandma, Catherine. He called her Gato Babo, whom Ruben regarded the most important person in his life. Zachary uh, was a captain in the, uh, in the Imperial Russian Army from December 1914 till January 1915, he participated in the Battle of Sarikamush on the Russian Ottoman border near Kars, where the Ottoman Turkish troops led by Minister of War and their Pasha were defeated. For combat merit and personal courage, Zachary was awarded the Order of St. Vladimir. And after retiring from the military service, he held the position of a bank president in Tiflis. Uh, Ruben's mother, uh, Virginia Talantarian Mamoulian, was born in today's Stepanavan in Armenia. Her father, Gevor Talantarian, a wealthy entrepreneur, owned businesses and estates in Tiflis. Since her early years, Virginia had been enchanted with the stage and acting. However, her family would never allow her to pursue the acting career professionally. Because of, uh, at the time, um, the uh, prejudice, prejudices against um, the actors were uh, prevalent. Yet Virginia would occasionally appear in amateur state plays and in the early Armenian and Georgian cinema under various names, so she would not be easily recognized. So this is one of the theater, um, uh, Zubalov Theater at the time, today it's Marjanishvili Theater in Tbilisi, just around the corner from the Mamoulian house. Um, that's where Virginia played 
and also led a troupe, which she organized along with he, her uh, husband and fellow actors. And they called it um, the Armenian Amateur, the Armenian Society, Artistic Society at the Zubalov House. Uh, the troupe that Virginia headed would also perform in the theater building of the Artistic Society, which opened in 1901. It was commissioned by Isai Pitoev, the father of French Armenian actor and director, George Pitoev. Today it's a uh, Rustavelli Theater in Tbilisi. Ruben had one younger sister, Svetlana. She was born two years later in Tiflis. In 1919, she married a Scottish soldier and moved to London. She had one daughter. In 1926, Svetlana tragically passed away in London. Neither Ruben nor the parents ever spoke about Svetlana in the public. It was considered a private matter and in a way taboo. The political climate in the Caucasus was beginning to change social and political unrest known as the Russian Revolution of 1905 swept across the Russian empire, including Tiflis. And in 1905, the family moved to Paris. In 1906, uh, Ruben enrolled in Lycée Montaigne and he was quick at learning French and would soon get on the school's honor uh, role and also received other scholastic honors. So for Mamoulian, Ruben often recalled that, um, that a Russian theater, uh, Armenian theater, excuse me, had an uh, important influence and it was responsible basically for his love and dedication to the theater, the stage, and later the screen. Um, this, uh, this photo was taken at, in the Mamoulian house, the backyard, with um, different Armenian um, uh, actors and actresses present. And on the top, you see the top row is um, um, uh, both Ruben's parents, uh, his sister is there as well, and other actors uh, of the Armenian theater, like um, uh, Ovanes Abelian, Arus Boskanyan, Armen Armenian, Ovin Lucy Simon Sebumian, and others. Um, but the Armenian actors and dignitaries and other public figures were not, were not the only guests at the Mamurian house. Uh, there were also other dignitaries, including the representatives of the Moscow Art Theater who would come to Tiflis on their visits. In London, um, where Mamurian uh, went to, Mamoulin went to, excuse me, Mamoulin went to London after um, the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. And the political and social unrest in the Caucasus uh, left little prospect for the family to stay afloat. He had uh, about $60 in his pocket that he, he was recalling when he left uh, Tiflis for London. Um, in London, Mamoulian worked in a carpet shop, but that wasn't enough to sustain him, his livelihood, and he learned photography, offering pictures to people in parks, churches, and weddings. He soon began working with the Makarov Repertory Company in London, and in 1922, he directed play The Unexpected Inspector at King's College, University of London. In the same year, Mamoulian directed a play by Austin Cage, the beating on the door at St. James's Theatre. Uh, in London, Mamoulian met Vladimir Rosing, uh, was, who was a Russian-born operatic and concert tenor. In 1923, at the recommendation of Rosing, Mamoulian was invited to the United States by George Eastman, the founder of the Eastman Kodak Company, to help uh, uh, Rosing direct the Rochester American Opera Company that was financed by George Eastman. Uh, Mamoulin arrived in New York during the so-called Roaring Twenties, a decade that marked innovative breakthroughs, economic prosperity, 
mass consumerism and the emergence of the so-called jazz age, a new cultural movement influenced by African-American music, rhythm, and dance traditions. During his stay in Rochester between 1923 to 1926, Mamoulian would direct operas, operettas, Gilbert and Sullivan, musical plays, and musicals, among others. While in Rochester, Rubin would also serve as artistic director and administrator of the Eastman School of Dance and Dra Dramatic Action. He was also managing, managing so-called deluxe programs staged at the Eastman Theater. In 1944, Ruben Mamoulian married Catherine Azadia Walzer Newman, uh, known as Azadia Newman, a Hollywood portrait painter. She was named Azadia after a section of Rock Creek Park in Washington, D.C., which was once the family estate. Azadia's father, Edwin Newman, was chairman of the Democratic National Committee during Woodrow Wilson. Azalea painted portraits of many celebrities and public figures, including John, John, John Crawford, Jean Tierney, U.S. Vice President John Nance Garner, and others. Ruben and Azalea had no children. In um, between 1926 and 27, Mamoulian directed productions and taught at the Theater Guild School in Scarborough, New York. Soon, Ruben's parents joined him in the United States. While wandering on the streets of Broadway, Mamoulian once observed, quote, the first thing that struck me on the streets of New York and on my first walk down Broadway was the fact that everybody was smoking cigars. Or at least that's the way it looked to me because in Europe, there is so little cigar smoking. I thought it to be a bad and rather unethical habit. A year later, I started smoking cigars and still do. I still think it to be a bad and unethical habit. Cigars and cats and animals would be some of Mamoulian's artistic trademarks. In um, Mamoulian's stage production on Broadway basically started with DuBose and Dorothy Hayward's play, Orgy, that was staged in 1927. It was Mamoulian's first Broadway stage um, production that um, starred an all African American cast and this production had made him famous overnight. Mamoulian was renowned for handling the so-called folk material at the time. He believed that intuition, conscious study and observation helped him understand the United States, its people and its culture. Recalling his experiences directly, directing an all African-American cast for the first time on Broadway, um, his first time on Broadway. Mamoulian noted, quote, the actors starting acting as, quote unquote, white in a, in a white fashion at the beginning of the rehearsal period, because they thought that that's what I would want them to do. I thought it was disastrous and told them so because they were only doing themselves an injustice and are marvelous when they're being themselves. They finally grasped what I meant and came to their own discovery that black is beautiful. And this was in 1927. This excerpt is from Oberstein's oral history uh, project and interview with Mamoulian in 1973. Mamoulian was also the original director of such benchmark Broadway classics as George and Ira Bershwin's American folk opera, Orgy and Bass, that was based on the production for me. Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein's Oklahoma in 1943 was also directed by Ruben Amuyan, as well as Carousel and Maxwell Anderson's and Kurt Whale's Lost in the Star in the Stars, among other productions. Um, according to Mamouyan, his method of blending song, dance, dialogue, music, story, and rhythm with an emphasis on dramatic and psychological conflict into a unified whole found its full expression in Oklahoma. He followed the same technique in Carousel. 
for which he received the Donaldson Award for Best Direction for the season of 1944-1945. Thomas Hischak, one of the authorities on American musical theater, regards Oklahoma as the most influential work in the history of the American musical theater. He writes, it was the first fully integrated musical play and its blending of song, character, plot, and even dance would serve as the model for Broadway shows for decades to follow. In 1955, Mamoulian was asked by the State Department, uh, the US State Department, to direct a European tour of Oklahoma. In the same year, Mamoulian received the medal from the city of Paris and the plaque of Versailles for staging Oklahoma in Paris and Versailles, respectively. The most prolific period in Mamoulian's film career fell on the so-called golden age of Hollywood um, between 1930s and 50s, dominated by the major Hollywood studios. Following his success on Broadway, Mamoulian became one of the, sought, um, one of the most sought after directors on, on Broadway and in Hollywood. Mamoulian experimented and directed films in a wide array of genres such as musical, horror film, or although Mamoulian never did really regard uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as a horror film. Um, and yet that's how he has been classified. Uh, he also directed musical comedy, gangster film, among others. He often stressed that doing films in one genre would bore him to death, and he simply couldn't do it. His first film, um, was one of the early talking pictures called Applause that was made in 1927. Um, it was produced in, at the Paramount Studio in Astoria, New York. His innovations used in the picture included restoring mobility to the camera and for the first time using two sound channels to record sound. Some of other Mamoulian's major breakthroughs in the development of the American and to a certain extent world cinema include the innovative use of sound to express thoughts during a silent, silent close-up in city streets, the use of first-person camera substituting for an actor, and the invention of synthetic sounds to express emotions in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Another picture made at Paramount was Love Me Tonight where the Mamoulian skillfully integrated dialogue, song, rhythm, verses, and music into one coherent unity. Becky Sharp, directed by Mamoulian, was the first full-length feature film shot in color using the new three-strip technical process. Colors were used for emotional and psychological effects in Mamoulian's pictures. Mamoulian's color theory found further expression in his film, Blood and Scent, in which the director turned to color palettes used in famous paintings to emotionally and dramatically portray the scenes in the picture. Silk Stockings, shot in 1957, was Mamoulian's last film, which he artistically blended, um, in which he artistically blended dramatic action, song, dialogue, and dance with the letter expressing the character's personality. Animals, as I mentioned earlier, and cats in particular, were some of Mamoulian's artistic trademarks that would appear in almost all of his pictures. Mamoulian's clashes with studio bosses affected his reputation in many ways. In 1944, he was fired from film Laura and from Porgy and Bess in 1958, both times replaced by director Otto Preminger. In 1961, due to the different, different opinions on where the film ought to be shot, Mamoulin resigned from Cleopatra. Eventually, Mamoulin's uh, films, um, so the last film, as I mentioned, was Silk Stocking. Still, a number of Mamoulian's films uh, won prizes and awards at the International Film Festivals in Venice. In 1936, his comedy musical, uh, The Gay Desperado, 
Rodman will win the Foreign Press Society Award for Best Direction, and also the New York Film Critics Award for Best Film, both received in 1936. A few words on art and directing, the way Mamoulian understood them. The Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary defines art as, quote, something that is created with imagination and skill, and that that is beautiful or that expresses important ideas or feelings, end of quote. Also, uh, quote, works created by artists, paintings, sculptures, etc., that are created to be beautiful or to express important ideas or feelings, end of quote. Mamoran viewed both the stage and screen productions as forms of art, where individual directors or artists not only coordinated various components of the production, but also creatively contributed to all of the comprising elements. According to Mamoulian art, the important task of the director is to create a new world, which is subject to definite laws and within which every detail is consciously and deliberately organized to form a harmonious integrated pattern. Having all the source materials at, at hand, the director must, must create a mental picture of dramatically organized life, which would best express the story." End quote. That was his personal note written in 1954. To achieve this, Mamoulian would use the following mediums, dance, dialogue, shadows, light, dramatic action, music, paintings, color, sound, and many others. All of them dramatically and rhythmically integrated into one unit. Uh, coherent story. For Mamoulian, the stage and screen represented two distinct ways of expressing art, with the stage being the art of collective acting and dialogue, while the screen embodied the art of the moving images, where the camera served as the main artistic tool. For Mamoulian, um, um, Rhythm and integration have been two of the most important principles which he had strived to follow um, in all of his productions. And throughout his life, he directed a total of 44 stage productions and 16 films, all of which in one way or another reveal his artistic touch. Overall, Mamoulian believed that art should serve life. He called it art for life's sake, life's sake, for men's sake. For him, stage productions and films in particular were a powerful medium to contribute to the beauty of the earth and to make the world a better place, albeit temporarily. On Armenian heritage. In referring to his Armenian heritage and as Carla and Meg has mentioned he was proud of his Armenian heritage and um, has never shied away from emphasizing it everywhere he would go, pretty much in most of his uh, interviews and, and speeches. In referring to his Armenian heritage, Mamoulian liked to recount a story when American theater director, producer, and playwright George Abbott uh, advised him to change his last name to M Mormon after the Mormon automobile to make it easier for people to remember and to possibly advance his uh, career uh, in the United States. Mamoulian humorously recalled that despite being called Macmoulian, a Scottish version of his last name, Mr. Linoleum, much Mulian, the Marx Brothers uh, reference to Mamoulian, Mamu, Dr. Jekyll, Mulian, um, by Shalyapin and Mamulov, Ruben decided to keep his Armenian version of his family name. Mamulov and his parents were frequent guest speakers at major Armenian cultural, artistic, academic, and religious events. For Mamulov being Armenian did not preclude him to embrace, um, not preclude him from embracing the American identity with equal zeal he managed to blend the two together. In 1962, on the occasion of consecration of Saint 
Sarkis Armenian Church in Los Angeles. Mamourian spoke about the importance of having Armenian churches, quote, so that in this country, the United States, we keep our faith and in the meantime, perform our duties to this country, the United States, as citizens, end of quote. Um, that was in the mirrors, Armenian Mirror's Spectator from 1962. Mamourian believed that the United States was the only country where people could worship freely, develop their talents, and reach their fullest potential. Mamourian was also known for making significant changes to scripts that he would agree to direct based on his artistic conceptions, of course. In 1943, Mamourian volunteered to direct American poet Walt Whitman's poem, I Hear America Singing for the Treasury Department. One of the changes Mamourian made was replacing the word Arabia in the text with that of Armenia. And that's how the show went into, was aired. Although tried, but Mamourian never really got to direct an Armenian film. In the 1930s, specifically 1934, MGM purchased rights to create a cinematic rendition of Franz, uh, Franz uh, Werfel's epic novel, um, 40 Days of Musadaf, that was to be supervised by producer Irving Thalberg and directed by Ruben Mamourian. The award-winning novel, as you may know, tells a story of the Armenian community members, the villagers living not far from Musadaf, who resisted the Ottoman forces um, and till their rescue by the French. However, facing pressures from the Turkish government and trying to avoid international scandals, MGM uh, eventually ab abandoned the project. Besides being a stage and screen director, Ruben Mamouyan was also a writer and a poet. In 1962, the Armenian General the Benevolent Union published a poem by Mamouyan titled Armenia. The poem was inspired by Lord George Byron's lines that, quote, it was in Armenia that paradise was placed and it was in Armenia that the dog first alighted, end of quote. If you allow, I will read the poem. Armenia. On this wide earth, there is one spot of ground all men should cherish as their native land. For it was there that paradise was found, the Bible says, by the Almighty's hand. And it was there that God created men in his own image, Adam, earthly father of all of us, white, black, or tan, all born of Eve are common by my mother. In that same land did Noah's ark alight on Ararat, the mound that topped the waters, and there the dove achieved her fruitful flight, and men survived in Noah's sons and daughters. That blessed ground those faithful mountain slopes where God once walked, where mortal life began, where Adam cried and Noah's worked his hopes, is called Armenia, native land of men. In a way, uh, in my opinion, uh, this poem symbolizes Ruben's eclectic identity, his egalitarian views, um, and also his life for his Armenian heritage and Armenia. In 1971, after very long separation of more than 50 years, Ruben visited Armenia and his native Georgia. Mamourian also wrote books. One of them was Abigail, the story of the cat at the manger, basically a children's book. Um, and it was published in 1964. And another book, um, that was published in 1965 was Mamourian's version of Shakespeare's Hamlet. The advent of television and antitrust actions in the late 1940s and 1950s in the United States marked a steady decline in the studio system and Hollywood's golden age. By the early 1960s, Mamourian's theatrical and filmic career was over. His personal files containing contained numerous script offers, 
which he had turned down, since none of them appealed to him, according to him. From the 1960s, Mamouyan was mostly engaged in writing, lecturing, attending film festivals, and giving interviews. On February 8, 1960, for his contribution to the motion picture industry, Mamouyan received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, um, as you may know, located at 1709 Vine Street in Los Angeles. Mamouyan was one of the founders of the Directors Guild of America established in 1936, an organization that represents the creative and economic rights of directors and other diverse groups involved in film, television, documentaries, news, sports, commercials, and others. Ramona was also, as Carla mentioned, one of the founding honorary members of the Armenian Film Foundation, a nonprofit educational and cultural organization dedicated to the documentation and preservation of Armenian heritage in multimedia format. In 1967, Mamourian got recognition from mayor of New York, uh, John Lindsay, stating that, quote, for many years, the productions of Mr. Mamourian have considerably added to the appreciation of New York as a center of theatrical entertainment of the highest quality, end of quote. He was inducted into the American Theater Hall of Fame in 1981. A year later, 1982, Ramulian received the Directors Guild of America's Lifetime Achievement Award in feature film. In 1984, he received a Life Achievement Award from the Los Angeles Film Critics Association. And the same year, the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters elected Mamouyan to American honorary membership. Mamouyan passed away in 1987, almost forgotten. The Mamouyan's Beverly Hills house with its antique furniture was reported to be torn apart by close to 40 cats that Alvedia and Ruben had sheltered. This, however, is not how Ruben Mamouyan would want to be remembered. When I was in Los Angeles to conduct research, thanks to the master's uh, uh, support, um, I miraculously connected with Zahri Burjan and her family who had taken care of the Mamouyan couple before Mamouyan's passing. Thanks to them, Ruben Mamouyan was laid to rest in the Forest Lawn Memorial Park Cemetery. And certainly thanks to other people who have in one way or another supported Mamouyan in different ways. Ruben's life was marked with outstanding triumphs and bitter downfalls. Mamourian has never really overcome American film critic Andrew Serra's description of him of, an, of the innovator, quote, the innovator who runs out of innovations. According to some, Mamourian's stylistic variety made it challenging to fit him into an uh, artery's framework. In addition, although there are a number of important biographical studies about Mamourian, his early formative years, his Armenian identity, and many other topics have not been fully explored to this day. However, with the advent of the archives, more and more scholars and experts begin to re-examine Mamourian's legacy. Regardless of whether Mamourian's stage and screen productions or his personality are appealing or not, he has helped shape the history of the American, um, and also, I would dare to say, the world, theater, and cinema. And in his legacy, um, his legacy should not be forgotten. I would like to end my presentation with the following quotes. The true vocation of a theater is to uplift, elevate the soul, enrich the heart, and a noble than men. A film must have two elements. It must deal with the real world and show how it could be made better. Ruben Mamoulian. Keep laughing from his diary, from his uh, young ages, and thank you so much for, for listening to my presentation. So if there are any questions uh, or comments or
any suggestions, I'd be happy. Milena, thank you so much. And uh, that, that was a wonderful overview of, of Mamoulian's life and career and, and insights into his, his work, his, his art, and, and, and himself as a, as a person. Um, I, I will claim the, the privilege uh, while we're waiting for other questions to, to show up in the Q&A function. Please use the Zoom Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen to, to submit any questions. Uh, so I'll, I'll claim the privilege of, of place to to comment. Um, I was probably, uh, I think I was in high school when I first saw a Mamoulian film, uh, his, his 1933 film, Queen Christina with, with Greta Garbo. I don't know if I knew, I had a real understanding that it was a Ruben Mamoulian film at that time, but that was right around the time that the, the VCR uh, opened up to me the world of late night movies that uh, I was sleeping through previously and before the days of Turner classic movies when you could see so many of these films that were out of circulation for so long. When I was in college, my film professor uh, very wisely included uh, Love Me Tonight in, in the course. It's, it's a film that is so magnificent, so joyous to watch. Uh, I, I would hope everybody who hasn't seen it, who's watching, will find the opportunity to do so. So I could never really understand why this guy didn't get more attention for, for his films. And I think you've certainly touched on, on some of the reasons for this. Uh, the, the comments from, from Andrew Saris is maybe the most, most famously uh, damning of, of Mamoulian's talent. And in some ways, Mamoulian seems to be getting faulted for what in some ways was his greatest strength, uh, his, his innovations, his openness to, to experimentation and his eclect eclecticism. Uh, it makes you feel maybe a little bit better when you see some of the other great directors that uh, Andrew Saris places in the same bucket of directors whom he calls less than meets the eye. People like John Huston, Ilya Kazan, David Lean, Billy Wilder, William Wyler, and other really fine filmmakers who like Mamoulian uh, are damned with the faint praise of, of being less than meets the eye. I think a lot kinder in his and, and better in his assessment of Mamoulian is uh, David Thompson, who in his biographical dictionary of film writes aptly that Mamoulian's is a fascinating career, like one of his own movies, a garland of pretty blooms held together without obvious support. Few other directors of his facility worked so spasmodically in movies or made such disparate material their own. What seems at first sight a disordered involvement in cinema is based on the most profound and fruitful integrity, which is, I think, a nice way of, of uh, recognizing the fact that Mamoulian didn't have one dominant style or one dominant theme, but he did a lot of different things really well and with great artistic integrity. So uh, I, I choose to to elevate uh, Thompson's uh, judgment over, over that of Saris. Um, we do have a question here, and it is this. Um, his directors, his DGA con contributions remain legendary and deserve more emphasis. This 25 year member can attest to his archive at the Guild, that his archive at the Guild is cherished by our members. Mamoulian's time will come Thanks to scholars like you, comments Ted Bogosian. Thank you, Ted. And uh, I would like to ask M Milena then, do you see that there may be a, a critical reassessment of Mamoulian and his contributions going on and which hopefully you're contributing to, but which perhaps others are taking up as well? Or, or does this, this uh, damning him with, with faint praise continue to be the predominant way of seeing him? Um, thank you, Mark, and thank you also for 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 the comment. Um, I I do see. In fact, um, I think there are two main groups. I, I I divide people into two major groups. One is the uh, is the group uh, the supporters and who view and approach and study understand the Mulian through Andrew Sarris uh, analytical framework and paradigm. And there also is another group of who I called revisionists. Um, these are the people who, um, 
I don't know whether fortunately or unfortunately, I see many of them coming from outside of the United States, from, from Italy, um, the UK, um, and other places. Um, but I do see that there are more and more um, uh, studies and, and scholars also who basically look at Mamouian in a different way. And their assessment comes from um, their work and their also archival work. Because as I mentioned, Mamounian was a private man and he tailored his version of his, um, how to say, a, of his, his uh, the way he, he projected his own vision and version of himself. And he recounted stories, similar stories many times. And so some of the people would look at it and say, well, he's just repeating himself. But on the other hand, Mamouian, um, in a way, was trying to show that his clashes, his battles were there because he viewed his work as artistic. And that was, in a way, his probably, in, in one of the um, uh, interpretations, and I think is one of the important ones, is that that was how Mamouian tried to remind that he wasn't uh, that, that he should be also regarded and classified as, as, as an, um, um, an artist. And that was mainly after Andrew Sarris' uh, critic, uh, critic, criticism of Mamoulian. Anyway, so I do to uh, say, I do think that um, more and more people are um, coming with an open mind and especially, again, uh, can't emphasize this enough that the archives um, the Library of Congress and other places are offering rich material um, and they're available to anyone to come and explore. Of course, I'd it like, helps. To, I'd like yes. to add, Mark, to that. Please, Carla. That um, I think we're in an age now where, you know, more people can see the work in different formats in different ways. Um, and so you can create new generations of audiences that are curious about directors in film in a different way, in a new way. So that's, I think that that helps. Um, and I also think with his birthday coming up next year, the big birthday that, you know, certainly from the point of view of Armenian Film Foundation and the Armenian community, that, that we should all strive towards, I think the, you know, celebrating him um, and drawing attention to him because we can circulate a greater appreciation of him just by doing that. And I know at UCLA, they've done a restoration of Becky Sharp and so um, we're hoping that we can, you know, draw attention to that next year. Um, and some you know, people who are not familiar with some of his films, I mean, he's got such an amazing collection. Um, so I think drawing attention to that helps. And, and, and I think as a filmmaker myself, what I'm impressed by, the more I've learned about him, is the amount of creative risk that he was willing to take not just moving from country to country, some of it by necessity, which in and of itself takes a lot of courage, but moving from, from theater to photography and photography to film, surviving, but that, that, that sort of the soul of who he was and trying to present it in whatever he was doing, whether it be theater, photography, whatever, he was looking for a way to express himself as an artist. And that takes courage. Um, then to be recognized in the way that he was, uh, after taking those risks, that's something to be commended. So from my point of view, I see him as somebody who succeeded um, with a lot of adversity. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, that was the impression that I had after reading and perusing literally thousands of pages and listening to more than hundred of hours of Mamoulian's interviews. And you know, in one way or another, you can sense a person's personality even through the, um, the pages. And Ramurian was a very sensitive person deep inside. He was very, um, in a way, his, his public mask was trying to cover his inner um, sens sensitivities. But he definitely, he deeply believed in, in the, in the uh, in the arts and the noble mission of the arts in his opinion. And so he was ready to take any battle um, 
for the sake of the art. So, yes, I absolutely agree. One hopes it helps too that his films are much more accessible uh, now uh, than they were uh, really not all that long ago, uh, thanks to outlets like Turner Classics and, and of course home video releases. There was a time when I think it was very hard to see most mm -hmm. of Mamoulian's films probably for, for decades. And I think there were only a couple of them that really regularly turned up on, on television in, in those days. So his, his films were out of the, the consciousness of most people for, for an awfully long time. Uh, and, and hopefully now that's, that's less, less the case. I wanted to ask uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry Papazian, who, who joined us uh, er, earlier and didn't have a chance to speak, if you'd like to say anything, Jerry. Hi. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry I was a few minutes late. Um, uh, I, you know, I would just say Carla said it all in her remarks. I did hear the end of her remarks, and we had talked about it earlier this morning. So I just think this is th it was just an incredible talk this, uh, this morning here. And thank you for the research you've done. And uh, it will uh, uh, kind of lead into some of the things that we at the Film Foundation are planning for next year. So excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was also wanted to point out that um, uh, I was very surprised in general to um, not to see a film documentary about, in English about Ruben Mamoulian. Um, I've seen other documentaries made in French, in Armenian, um, but I think that hopefully that at some point it will become a reality. and and. The story of Ruben Mamouyan, the way he saw it, or the way he experienced and felt it, um, would be told. So that would be great for sure. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. the one documentary. The, in fact, the only other Mamouyan event, as I mentioned before, that that we've done in my time was the screening of Patrick Casal's uh, documentary, uh, which, and that was back fifteen years ago or more. So it's certainly high time for for uh, a, a proper appreciation of, of Mamoulian in, in a documentary. Um, we have a question here from Karina Goshen. Hi, Karina. Uh, what do you think by the end of his life that Mamoulian thought of his work or what he thought would become his legacy after he was gone? Have you encountered such uh, self reflection in in the in your research? Thank you, Karina. I, I, I have. Um, I think Mamoulian considered, at least in my reading, Mamoulian considered art to be eternal and to be universal, a language that didn't need any translation. Uh, Mamoulian was sad in a way that his um, convictions or so to speak theories would be forgotten and sometimes not taken seriously. He believed that through his work, he could light other lights in people's hearts and they could carry it over from generation to generation. And that's, that's a great question because that's what I felt. Um, and that's how I was reading him. He was set by the, um, in, in the, at the dawn of his career, basically when he was, pretty much alone. He was thinking and writing and contemplating. There were so many notes uh, on pretty much any paper that he could find. Um, and yes, in a way, he um, was hopeful also that somebody or something or the force will come back and art as with its mission, which with its beautifying and mission uh, to make the life better and more, um, for the sake of the people would be resurrected and restored. Um, and, uh, on another note is Mamoulian thought that there were so many violence um, around him that he saw art as the only way out, so. Karina also points out that while Turner Classic Movies showcases actors, directors, cinematographers, you know, in week long features and so forth, they've never done so for Mamoulian, even though they do show his films. So if any of you, especially if you out there in LA have uh, the ears of anyone at, at uh, Turner Classic Movies, perhaps you can uh, 
whisper the right words in their ears to to get this to happen next year for his 125th uh anniversary Jerry, Jerry I'm sorry I cut you off I believe I was just going to add or with Ted, Bogos Ted Bogosian's comment about the DGA Ted if I could make a shout out to you on this format um, maybe we should get the DGA involved in celebrating him next year uh, since he was such an important um, influence there um, because it couldn't hurt to have their their involvement absolutely this must happen uh, Jerry, did I cut you off? Were you trying to say something before? No, excuse me. Uh, I'd like to ask Milena then, uh, what what is next for you and, and your work on Mamoulian? What do you hope to, uh, when you, you talk about bringing your work to fruition, what, how, how do you see that happening and, and in what forms? Um, so at this stage, um, I'm envisioning publications and possibly a book, uh, most likely a book. Um, but I also, originally this project started as a foundation for a film, a documentary in memory. Um, there's so many material that I have encountered and so many beautiful and different ways that the story could be told. So I've started collecting so much material, but then I realized that um, I'm not a uh, filmmaker. Um, I'm not a professional director. So uh, what I've been doing lately is mostly um, compiling materials for a book on Ruben Amorian. Um, and um, tell the story the way he wanted it to be told, I think, or tell the story in his own voice. I guess that would be a better way to put it. Is he uh, recognized or celebrated in, in, uh, in Georgia? where he was born? You know, let me, let me tell you a very brief story. When I went uh, to, to do research in Mukhrani, where Ruben's father was born and where he spent summers, um, we were passing by um, houses and we're looking for a place, a place. Um, so there was a passerby and we stopped the car and I asked him, I said, do you know there was a person that lived here, the Mamoulians, and he looked at me and said, well, he shot the mask of the Mark of Zorro, right? Is that the guy? I said, yes. Wow. Um, and so he started telling me about Mamoulian. And I said, did you, have you met him? I've read about him, he told me. Um, and, um, but in 1971, as I mentioned, Mamoulian was in Georgia. And he was asked to be taken to Mohrani. And so um, the people still remember his visit. Um, Mamoulian is um, revered, I would say, in Georgia and the former Soviet Union. However, there's not much information about him um, known um, either. So he's kind of a walking or not even walking, a speaking legend, so to speak. Um, he, um, people have heard about him. People are excited, have, have watched his movies, some of them, um, which uh, were taken as trophies by the Rush, the Soviet um, um, uh, army uh, from Berlin. And the, his, he, his movies and other movies were also shown um, in the Soviet Union. That's how some of the Georgian film experts have shared about Mamoulin that they were aware of him as well. Um, so yes, he is known, but he is unknown at the same time, I would say. Question from an anonymous attendee. What is an in interesting fact or notion about Mamoulian that intrigued you during your research? What have you learned that you, about Mamoulian that is most intriguing that you didn't know before is my rephrasing of the same good question. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, what Mamoulian, what attracted in Mamou, me and Mamoulian in the first place was his ethnographic and detailed descriptions of the places he had lived. And that was also true with my birthplace, Tbilisi. Um, I was reading his notes, um, his personal letters to his family and the family's letters. And what is interesting is the codes, the cultural codes that they've used and some of them we use today have not really changed. Um, the Armenian, for example, linguistic codes have remained almost the same. 
Um, and um, uh, he was in a way, um, how shall I put it? He was someone who, when I would work and anytime I would find free time, I would rush into the Library of Congress and, 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 and read more. So every time he was telling something new about my culture, my city, and about the United States that I was also learning. I would say mostly for me was cultural, um, which I think that Mamouya was also an anthropologist in some ways. Hmm. Okay. Then uh, I want to say, uh, oh, excuse me, there's a, I'm not going to say in conclusion because there's one more question. Uh, I don't understand the question. Uh, anything on of gods and monkeys? Well, the gods of monkeys uh, was Mamoulian's unfinished um, memoir. Ah, excuse me, sure. And that is, um, he was asked to, well, he, there, there was a publisher who was interested in, interested in publishing the uh, Mamoulian's memoirs. However, he never really completed. And so he, um, there was just a section of his writings um, that is still there. Um, it is an interesting uh, story and also his uh, understanding. It's basically his life in a way told in a theatrical and, um, and theatrical and cultural way. Um, so, um, I think it's a story that should be told. That's all I can say at this stage. Um, um, but uh, it, it tells a great deal about the Caucasus, uh, Tiflis at the time. Um, and again, this cultural notions of theatricality in the Caucasus um, and part of the Caucasian identity, not the Caucasian white, but the Caucasian from the Caucasus identity. Very interesting, thank you. Then let me now say thank you so much to uh, the Armenian Film Foundation, the Askegian Museum, to Carla, Maggie, and Jerry for joining us, to the audience, and of course, most of all, to Milena for sharing uh, your, your research and your insights. And we certainly look forward to hearing from you more in the future about Mamoulian and, about, and to hearing more about Mamoulian in general and hopefully seeing more about Mamoulian as well. So again, thank you for a, a wonderful program and uh, really thank appreciate you, it. We'll be in touch. Stay well, yes. everyone. Thank you for staying till the end of the presentation. Bye. Bye-bye.